Well, hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Angular Air. My name is Alyssa Nichol, and today with me, I'm so excited to have these two amazing panelists. I've got Mike Brocky. Hello, Mike. Hello. How are you doing today? Good, good, good. <laughs> Up and down is easy. Left and right is hard. You know, it's coming for me. How are you doing, Justin? Hey! <laughs> hey, doing good, doing good. Thank you. Wonderful. And our guest of honor for the hour, Mike Ryan. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing so well. How are you doing? Uh, so, so good. It's fall. Fall is in the air. It actually, like, is sweater weather here. So I'm just like... Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you saw the meme, but it's like when you wake up and there's the, the temperature is ho, ho, ho. And you're like, ho, oh, you know, I, I was dancing out my door this morning <laughs> in my sweater. So it's it's I'm marvelous. Is it cold with where you are? Where are you at? Yeah. So I've migrated from the deep south to the mm -hmm. Pacific Northwest last mm -hmm. year. So this is my second like real fall I've ever gotten. And the leaves are changing colors and the weather air is crisp. And it's like a real fall season. And I'm just so here for it. I feel like you have even colder fall though than I do because I'm in like the 60s and 70s. Are you colder than that? No, that's about right. About 60s okay. and 70s. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's like a perfect like 68 degree day yesterday with the sun out okay. and it was just glorious. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So would yeah. you like to introduce yourself for those who don't sure. know you and maybe also tell people where they can find you online? Yeah. So my name is Mike Ryan. Uh, I'm known these days. You can find me working on a project called Polaris. Uh, we do site reliability for web applications. You can learn more at getpolaris.ai. And you can follow me on Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn, all those fun socials at Mike Ryan Dev. Awesome. Amazing. Well, I am very pumped for our topic today. It's the user experience of site reliability. Before we mm -hmm. dive in, I wanted to ask you, though, where does this come from? Is this from a, a recent passion that you, like, facepalmed into? Or is this <laughs> – where, where does this topic come from for you? Yeah, this topic comes from my last full-time job before I started working um, in consulting. So for about five years, I worked at an industrial IoT company, and we built web applications to monitor and control thousands of IoT devices in large American manufacturing facilities. And uh, because we controlled the software from the node to the cloud to the user screen, we had this really complex architecture to support that. But we're also a small scrappy team of like 16 engineers. So there's a lot of code, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of infrastructure, not many engineers to support it. Is and that a small team? I just have to clarify. I'm like, it, hold on. Holy small. crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Because I was like, my last job, I called a small team and there were four of us. So you're like 16. <laughs> I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> that feels huge. Okay. No, I mean, you got to think about it like this, right? Because we have these really small devices and they're running embedded C code with some Python on it. And those are talking to like basically what you think of like a router, which is connected to the internet. And that's got a bunch of Python on it. And then we have like a full large AWS application with some machine learning in it. And then you have some front end engineers. And when you kind of think about like how many layers of the stack we had at that size company, mm -hmm. we're also making our own hardware too. 16 folks really isn't a lot for, I think, that much of a stack. Right. I mean, that is just, there was just a lot of moving pieces. Um, so you're not wrong. 16 is probably more medium sized. But to us, I think it felt small because we just were doing, we're fighting off such a big problem. If that makes sense. No, it does. Absolutely. Depends on how many features you got in the backlog, right? I mean, that's <laughs> large and you can't grind through them, then your team's not big enough. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, there was just, there was more than we could handle. And one of, the repercussions of that is we got ourselves into something that I now affectionately call reliability hell. And I'm really curious if any of y'all have been on a team that's found themselves in reliability hell. But it basically looks like this. You have worked really hard. You built up this application. And then surprise, you got users and customers. And the architectural decisions you made don't end up working out the way you had hoped they'd work out. And you have a lot of reliability problems. So maybe you're having like downtime or customers are encountering bugs frequently. And as a developer, you're being interrupted constantly to go fix these bugs, address these issues, deal with these things. And it lasted for um, probably a full year, and it took us a ton of time to fix and course correct. And so I think that's where a lot of this passions come from is just like having this really grueling development experience, where I just found myself bouncing from like, outage to outage, fixing yeah. reliability and said reliability and thinking, like, okay, there was an, there was an end to it though. Cause I know people 
who well, I, I don't name, work there anymore. So for oh, me, okay. there was an end, right? Like, I don't live that life anymore. Okay. I just thought that you had like gotten the code or the team or both to a certain place that it was like, it is over now. We live in no, peace. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, yeah, I, I'm, being, I'm being a little facetious, but that, that actually did happen. <laughs> we got it to a place of stability. We fixed a lot of the major underlying issues and just really matured as a team around like the full discipline of site reliability engineering and how to monitor that application the right way and take care of it and be good caretakers. Um, so yeah, we did get to that place where it didn't feel like every day there's a fire. But I mean, every day for what felt like a year, there were just these like really massive fires that we had to go put out. So it, with it, a lot of those issues, were they stemming from server side, client side, your nodes or all of the above? Yeah, it's it's all of the above. But honestly, it's it's mostly cloud backend, like cloud backend would be probably the largest repercussion of it. And I'm not throwing cloud backend engineers under the boat, under the boat here. To be really clear, that just happens to be where I think a lot of the application complexity came from, where a lot of the user facing downtime came from. And it is usually from like like changing configuration or pushing new updates. Like mm. deploying new features or changing some bit of configuration was almost always the culprit when it came to those outages. Um, and so, yeah, it just, I think this passion has come from that work experience of being like, okay, I'm just a, I'm just a front end engineer, right? I'm a UI engineer. I come from the Angular world, but there's got to be sort of maybe some better approaches or ways to think about reliability um, from a front end perspective that I don't think we talk about enough in the front end space or consider enough. And uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of where this topic comes from of the user experience of site reliability. So I think there's a lot of interesting ideas in there that aren't really explored all too often. So a big issue like this doesn't seem like it would have um, some golden hammer to be able to, we'll just hit it with this and everything will be fine and the same fix will work for everybody. It seems Never. like it would be very nuanced for each individual uh, customer. Is that where the consulting side comes into Tennessee. play or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're not wrong. Every incident's unique. Every incident has its own fix and there's no golden hammer and I'm not going to say there's a golden hammer. I think what I have sort of come to learn from all these experiences is that it doesn't matter if you have an EC2 instance with its CPU packed at 100% or you've misconfigured um, a load balancer to direct traffic to the wrong place or you've pushed some broken code to a Lambda function. At the end of the day, our Angular apps are consuming those APIs published by that backend and they're experiencing that degradation, right? And so from the end user's perspective, it almost always manifests into the same kind of condition, which is that your users are having a bad time. The app's not loading, pages aren't rendering, like something's just broken from their perspective and they're frustrated. And unfortunately, users, I think, often vote with their feet. They leave apps that are bad. That's what a lot of research indicates is that if, if an app is frustrating, like they're more likely to just abandon it than to let you know that it's frustrating to use. And so I think as an Angular developer, I've been thinking like, okay, if all the world's backend problems kind of manifest into a bad experience for my app users. Is there something as an Angular developer I could be doing to actually monitor or better address those those incidents? Like, is there a better user experience we can put around it? It seems to me it was it's something I feel like I would rear up against though because I'd be like, it is the backend's problem. <laughs> yeah. The backend should fix it, right? Like I have this very yeah. like, <laughs> but. I guess it is more of a team player and it's also like it makes your 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 product more robust if it can handle these failings kind I, I I don't know do you not have that Mike you seem very like we can take on your burden too <laughs> <laughs> but there there is no blame when you're talking to an end user they don't care they don't care if it was that the manager made a bad decision. They don't care if it was a front end engineer who wrote some bad JavaScript. They don't care if it was a database person who dropped the table. They don't really care. They know that the stuff they're trying to do isn't working. Yeah. And that's yeah. completely right. They don't know which, like, they, they don't know where to assign blame. And Alyssa, you're not wrong. I think inside of companies, like, the the immediate reaction is to assign blame, right? To be like, this is the backend's problem. Like the backend engineers, they broke it or 
you know, it's their fault that this has been misconfigured or some new update's been pushed. And I think in a lot of the teams that I've worked on, and I'd be curious what your experience has been, I think we end up kind of delineating responsibilities that way too. Like, because a lot of these problems stem from the backend, we sort of put the onus on backend engineers to put in place like observability tools, monitor their servers, own outages, that kind of thing. We kind of say, this is all a backend concern. We'll let the backend engineers deal with it. And as a front end engineer, well, I don't really have a lot of implication in reliability. And so I'm going to be more focused on the CSS of my Angular app or something like that. I don't know the styling of it. I look at it, uh, I kind of compare it to the sense of like, if I'm building a form for my application, I am thinking, trying to think through all the ways that a user could provide data into that and how do I protect it, right? How do I yeah. um, validate that data? How do I ensure I get the right data? How do I ensure there's no misuse of that? I'm guarding my application because that's a data source, right? And so I, I project that same process to backend or, or setup or whatever that like, my application is going to be subject to this data source or these commands or this config somewhere else. So I need to try and project all the scenarios so that I'm covering that in my application development, right? And I think that helps kind of start to guide, guard against that, hey, I, I don't control that, so I don't know what could come, but I need to try and see all the scenarios that could happen to try yeah. and build protection at, at this layer, right? And be prepared. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really thoughtful approach, right? I think I think as front end engineers to get into some software philosophy, I think we own the user experience. We're in charge of the bits of code that the user interacts with. And the way you described it, it's kind of it's kind of on us to protect the users from the edge cases of our systems. Right? Our systems are gonna throw errors, they're gonna be a little slow sometimes. They're gonna do things that would be frustrating. And we actually have the capability as UI developers to maybe make that not so frustrating, to smooth off the edges, make it a little bit more pleasant, give them helpful error messages, put in place loading indicators, handle errors in ways that are really graceful and elegant, make sure people don't lose progress, things of that nature. And there's, you know, there's a lot of that protection that I think we have the responsibility to do that maybe we don't always think about as much as maybe we should. Yeah, I think some of that, from my experience, comes too from as front-end developers or application developers, you may get functional requirements from another team, right? So this mm -hmm. is what we're going to do. And um, all these scenarios are not always thought about, right? Um, so a lot of times it, it falls into the development team to really have that projection of, of, are they digging in deep enough? And have they had the experience to think about these kind of questions of like, well, what if a, a user does this? Or what if the back end we make two calls and one of them fails. Like, how do we gracefully fall back? Like, like somebody has to ask those questions to then prepare that requirements to make sure you're covering it. And I think that a lot of times I see that slip through the gaps because a developing team will will take a functional requirement, implement it, and nobody's asking those questions. And so then you go to production and those things happen and nobody was, you know, pre prepared. prepared for that. In like an ideal world, is there a person on a team that like that's their job to make sure that those questions are being asked or Justin. <laughs> Justin's yeah. that person for everyone. On every team across the world it's Justin. It's just... No it's wonder this email. isn't happening oh, oh. everywhere. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's so behind. I'm trying to get through it all. <laughs> but like cuz I know that we would all say okay every single developer should be asking this question about their bubble of code and product that they're responsible for. But I, I feel like that's, it's like that the psychology theory, whenever the blame is dispersed to everyone, no one picks up the banner. And so yeah. it's it, in my mind, I'm like, I feel like there should be a person who is like, like, is that a product manager's responsibility? Is that the like lead architect developer's responsibility? Like who should be honestly making sure the team is thinking about this stuff? Yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, don't know, know if I can say there's like one title. I mean, I think in an ideal world, the product manager would be thinking about the experience of the product. Um, I don't know if we're all blessed to get to work on teams with like good product managers though. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a, a real blessing sometimes. Mm. And so I don't know. I think the person who's in charge of making sure that we're handling these things is the person who feels most motivated to go make that change happen. Mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's usually how it plays out, right? That's how it plays out. 
And so it could be literally any of the titles you just threw out. It could be a front end engineer, a back end engineer, product manager. I mean, I don't know. It's just whoever feels excited enough to be like, hey, this could be better mm. and wants to champion that change on their team. Mm. Um, in, in my case, it's when I'm losing sleep over it. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is my shorty sense is going off. I need to <laughs> need to get this answer. <laughs> So is this, uh, Mike, is this something that that what we're talking about could solve this sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. This this kind of thing? Is there solutions here? Um, yeah, I don't know if road? there's any any real solution to this space. Like, I don't think there's an automatic solution. Um, I think one of the parts of this problem that I'm really interested in is around detecting of incidents. So like, we've all built Angular apps, and we all have built Angular apps, I'm sure, that show really nice error messages or like handle errors in a good way. But when your actual users hit one of those errors, how many of us actually knew that those users hit an error? Right? Like, did we wait? And how to replicate users? it, right? And what did like, they do? Exactly. Right? Like, how, how good are we at developers at actually knowing that our users are encountering a problem? And I think for me, I'll just fess up here. For the majority of my professional experience, the only way that I knew that a user had a problem is if they told us. And if you look into like the, the research of how users behave, like I'll take for me, for example, I'm a really socially anxious person. I know some of you might not believe it because I get on stage, but I really am a socially anxious guy. And so the idea of picking up a phone or typing in a form and like complaining about a problem kind of gives me a pit in my stomach. I don't do it. I don't want to tell someone that something's not working correctly. I would rather just like go um, sit in bed than do that. And so typically that means that I leave apps or experiences that make me uncomfortable in that way rather than tell someone. And I think that's common for a lot of people where they don't actually feel comfortable or confident enough to let someone know that something's not working because it is kind of a scary thing to do. But on the reverse side as a developer, if I'm waiting for someone to tell me that they've hit an error, that I'm kind of like waiting for a superhero of a user that actually can tell me that something's not working correctly, that can overcome those anxieties and can hopefully give me enough information to go replicate the issue, like Justin just mentioned. And so that's like, a, that's like, in my opinion, one of the worst ways to do incident detection because it really, it really requires something special, it really requires a special set of users and a special sort of set of circumstances to know that something's gone wrong. Um, and so that's where Polaris, the project that I'm working on, comes in. We're trying to do incident detection in a better way. We're trying to help developers detect that something's not going right inside of their apps um, without having to wait on those users to tell them that something's broken. So it's like if error XYZ is hit, there's reporting back of how it was hit or yeah. when? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you, you mentioned the term incident, incident detection. Is it also predicting? things that might happen mm -hmm. versus just, you know, reacting to errors? Yeah, that's a good question too. Uh, I think one of my favorite metaphors is kind of, it's kind of like a car or how do I want to put this? Like, think about a server. What, what causes a server to go down? I'm talking like a very old school server where it just eventually crashes. And usually what you experienced before. <laughs> that memory leak that you wrote. Yeah, the, yeah the, the, memory leak. Memory, memory leak. leak is a, yeah. That's yeah. a great example. It's memory leak. And what happens before a memory leak is usually things get slower first. And um, you know, you start to see degradation of performance before you see full outages. It's kind of like with um with like our electrical grids where we have like full blackouts, but before that we have brownouts. Right? Where where we maybe have a little less available capacity on the grid. And that's something that we're trying to do. So it's not necessarily predictive as much as like actually gathering the right set of metrics. So you can see that things are starting to get a little worse before they're really, really bad. Yeah, but it's it's awesome because it's it's thinking about, you know, how can you get those metrics? Like, like what metrics could you use to help tell it? I mean, that that's an awesome scenario that you just described of just noticing slowdown and that mm -hmm. can tell you something. And then you can say, hey, look, I, I need to probably think about taking action here just from this thing that's not something typical that you might think to record and, and watch out for, right? Um, that's right? Typically, like when I think of slowdowns, it's like, oh, well, everything's slow or, or everything's <laughs> fast, right? Introduce yeah. something you know, that, that makes everything slow. It's not a, it's getting slower, you know, from an instant. Yeah. And I wonder how you go about determining whether or not something's running slow. 
because yeah. you either need to do, in my opinion, or off the top of my head, one of two things. One, you need to just set a threshold. If it's taking longer than X amount of milliseconds, seconds, minutes, hours, whatever you specify, or a trend where you're not just logging how long the bad things are taking or looking for that, but also keeping track of the good things to see when there's a degradation over time. But that yeah. could Cause wouldn't be. Because wouldn't it have to be like per users? user too? Like it's like, because this user is on this network with this machine or something. So like, then you'd have to like be tracking that over a certain amount of time to just even determine a baseline. Oh, like, yeah. everyone's asking the good questions, right? <laughs> They're asking all the good questions. So many good questions. I'm like, I want to answer. I want to reply to all of them. Which one am I going to reply to first? <laughs> so okay, um, first, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to like, you have to, in order to like set those thresholds, you have to know what slow and fast means. And that's some that's actually not so easy to know what flow or fast means. And that's really specific to the kinds of apps that we're building. Right? Like if I'm doing a Google search and I'm typing in my text and I want to see results, fast to me might mean like really, really fast, right? Like hundred milliseconds, I want to start seeing results. But if I'm going through a form to like submit a loan application, and I know that there's gonna be some like processing of that of that form result before I actually get to see if I was approved for a loan or not. Fast might mean something completely different. Fast might be, mean like five to 10 seconds. And so fast and slow are really relative terms that I think we need to work, again, as the owners of the user experience with our product managers or our designers to define what is fast or what's acceptable here. Like what are our goals around the performance of our application? Um, one of my favorite things to highlight is that like pacemakers, as of a report in 2004, only had reliability of 99.7%, right? Which means that 0.3% of the time they could have errors. And that's just a, I know it's, it sounds so scary, but like things just have failures. Like, so how often are we allowing our apps to have errors and to display errors? Because they happen. We can't say they are never going to happen. That's impossible. And so in addition to figuring out how fast or slow things need to be, we also need to give ourselves some grace on how often we're allowing ourselves to show error messages to users. And to really just put some, again, thresholds around it, being like, this is an okay error rate. I'm okay with 99.9% .9 of the time things are working well. And I'm okay with these API requests taking around a second to complete. And once you have those definitions, then you get to do some thresholds and actually apply some, some smarter alerting or intelligence around it. And Alyssa, you bring up one of the, my favorite, favorite points about how you need to be thinking about this on a per user basis, because you're right, every user has a different phone in a different set of network conditions and they're all dispersed all across the world. And so they're gonna have different distances from whichever AWS region you selected to deploy your backend to. And so they're gonna have you know, a completely different user experience than another user um, because of all these different ways in which our users are unique. And so it's not enough in my opinion to actually monitor for fast, slow or error rate from a backend perspective, I think we should be measuring it from the front-end perspective because when we measure it from the front-end perspective, we get to think about all those differences for our users, right? If I'm measuring how fast something is going from the user's perspective, I get to think about, well, are they having like a 3G quality connection or a 4G quality connection? Are they using a really, really old version of iOS on an iPad that does actually happen to be once? And so the JavaScript's running really slowly on their device. Um, you know, are they in Hawaii? Again, this is another thing that's happened to me. Are they in Hawaii? And so they're really far from the U.S. East region in AWS, and they're exceeding that 15-second timeout that browsers impose on HTTP requests. Um, you know, you get to you get to answer a lot of really interesting questions like that when you actually monitor this from the end user's perspective, rather than trying to monitor it from the backend perspective. We talked a bit about like things that you would monitor, and a lot of that circulates around communication between the client and the server. Yeah. What about, have you gotten into the idea of, we talked about memory leaks as well, like potential memory leaks in the client where things are just running slow because of bloat within the client application. Yeah. It comes so, to mind, people not unsubscribing from observable and having memory leaks sitting out there of applications where users, if they're not necessarily, if it's like a business application and a user has that up all day long and they're in there for eight hours, memory leaks will definitely add up and uh, manifest itself in performance. Yeah. Um, and I want to be clear, like, I don't want, 
because I don't want this big, big player side. You can do this with Firebase Performance or Google Analytics. And so I'm going to talk about it as if you're using Firebase Performance, for example, because that's a completely free tool you can get as an Angular developer and you can get the performance SDK. So let's say, yeah, you wanted to measure like a workflow and see how long it was taking and how often it was going to fail. And you want to think about not just like backend performance, like how long the API requests are taking, but also front end performance, potential memory leaks are causing execution to slow down, whatever it may be. Let's say you're building an app where the user can log in and get to some dashboard. And we want to measure how long it takes for them to actually go from clicking login to viewing that dashboard and getting to a, like a rendered result. I think like a really smart approach here, if we're to use the Firebase Performance SDK, would be to use their SDK to start a timer the minute they click that login, and then hold a reference to that timer and hit stop the minute we actually have rendered the results for that dashboard. And within that time frame, there's a lot that happened. We're not just measuring how long the API requests took, but we're also measuring how much time our JavaScript spent in terms of execution, either issuing the request, processing the results request, waiting for our framework of choice to render data back to the screen. We're measuring a ton within that one measurement of time. And you know that means that when you're starting to put thresholds around that, around how fast that should be, there's a lot of your system that gets implicated into that measurement. And that's why I really like these front-end based measures for doing performance reliability, because you're capturing the entire stack. You're not just capturing one backend server, you're capturing everything all the way up to the point where the user got to see a result in there. And if it is because of an RxJS memory leak, you forget to hit unsubscribe, that's going to be, that's going to contribute to that timer just as much as if we misconfigured our uh, Lambda function that's issuing the request and it's taking longer than it should be. It seems like you would just get a large chunk of time back and then you just get to kind of debug from there or are there like markers so that it's like <laughs> and now it is the back end's turn right like how do we it's in this general area somewhere <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> which which it sounds like better than this area so i don't know all of it yeah. <laughs> no you're you're absolutely right there's i think there's two sides to the observability coin there's the detect of incidents, knowing that something's gone wrong, and then there's the debugging of incidents, figuring out what's gone wrong. And I think I've, I'm spending a lot more time on the first part, just detecting incidents. I think that's where front-end based tools are really, really smart, is to do incident detection in a way that's novel and good. But you're right, like in that timer, there's not enough granularity to figure out, okay, why isn't this working now? Like what's happened that's caused this amount of time to exceed whatever threshold I've set? And that's where I think there's a lot of interesting tools you need to start considering for the other side of the coin, debugging and you know starting to do under like trying to understand what's happening here. So like as a front end developer, you might I think we might have all heard of Sentry. It's a really popular choice. They do a lot to collect like console logs, performance metrics, things like that to help us debug. Okay, now that I know something's gone wrong, what's happening here? Or maybe that's when you start to rely on like some of those server logs to figure out what's happening on on the back end. Like why is this slowing down there? And so I really like to think about this problem as being just really separate, the detection of incidents and then the debugging of incidents. Do For either one, do you have to have user permissions for this? Can hmm. you just gather this timing data and stuff and send it back to yourself? With that's a good like, question. You, yeah, what, question. What are the rules? <laughs> <laughs> you have to <laughs> consent to cookies and then you're good, right? <laughs> no, yeah, you don't have to do, I mean, if you think about just the performance metric, there's no PII in that. There's no usernames attached to it. There's no secret or confidential user data associated with that measurement. All that measurement is, is its amount of time associated with some kind of workflow. How long did it take this one anonymous user to log in and get to the dashboard? Oh, so it's not attached to users in any way. Because I feel when like you, that would be, like, then how do you debug there in Hawaii, right? Like. Right. And so that's when you start to think about what information do you want to start attaching to that? And that's when you start to get into user permissions. Okay. It's like to do the Hawaii bit, you could ask for the user's location, but I think that's really obtrusive if you're not actually providing them any like application value for collecting that user information. And so I wouldn't go with that approach. I would just do like an IP address reverse lookup on my back end where I'm collecting that metric to get a rough sense of where they're located. Because you don't really need to have precise location. You just need to know, okay, they're in Hawaii. There's probably something uh, to do with that. 
as to why things aren't working. I don't need to know which specific island in Hawaii that they're in um, to get into debugging it. You might also want to track what browser they're using, um, what device type they have. Browsers now report back to developers what your user's effective connection quality is, which is really, really helpful in these cases. Um, I think we use these APIs a lot to build offline apps or to detect that an application is offline. But you can also use it to detect whether or not they've gone from like a 4G quality connection all the way down to something really slow like 2G quality. And capturing just that little bit of information can really help you out too, because they are on a 2G quality connection and they're starting to see a lot of timeouts in their HTTP requests. Probably not a backend issue. That's probably just your users in the middle of nowhere. You know, they're trying to get a lot of work done from the farm. And they're seeing some slowdowns because of that. Maybe that's not a real incident that you need to go uh, go resolve. And so for a lot of that data, you don't need any user permissions from the browser. That's just available to you from the JavaScript runtime. You can associate it. And in my opinion, that's not PII. It's nothing really identifiable to collect uh, browser and connection quality and IP address. That's just all pretty standard information to collect and helps you make more informed decisions about the measurements you're collecting. I kind of look at it as a um, iterative approach that you could take that'd be beneficial there when you talk about you know uh, identifying an incident doing the timer right like you, yeah. i could think in terms of okay i'm going to put this timer in certain spots in my app that i want to monitor and yeah. then i'll use that and if it comes if i get answers back that hey this is not hitting my threshold then i'll investigate further right exactly. or if hey it's all hitting the thresholds then i won't do any extra work to do performance monitoring or whatever there because i feel like everything's good so just start dropping in these kind of that approach what you're talking about with timers to start getting a, an idea of where you need to dig deeper right mm -hmm. and, and invest more time yeah absolutely plus going back to the question of like how fast is fast or how slow is slow um one of the other things that user experience research indicates is that like let's say that we set a goal of it being one second to get to that dashboard and then we put in this performance monitoring business and it turns out we're actually achieving it in like 300 milliseconds so we're not just beating our goal, we're like beating it by a lot. A lot of UX research shows that users get accustomed to, per to performance. And so if we continue to ship or deploy at that quality of performance, your users start to expect it. And so if you start to degrade closer to a second, you might be meeting your goal, but your users are still frustrated. And so even if you think everything's great, that everything's going well, there's still a lot of value in measuring and monitoring. That way you know what your users' expectations are of your application. Because the minute they have those expectations and you start to break those expectations, they're frustrated and they're not happy anymore. And I have been I have been a part of teams that were like, we are going to slow down these calls right here, slow down yeah. because they don't match up to the rest of the application. And we just, we can't have that. They're going to start wanting that and they can't have that. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> so I get it. Like, I get it. This is like a little psychological game that you're playing with your users. Like, no, you're yeah. happy. Trust me. But <laughs> yeah, you're ha if they're happy, don't make it, you know? Yeah. It, it's funny. Picking these thresholds, is, there's like a whole art and science around it. But you like really want to perfectly select the number where your users go from being happy to being unhappy. And it is not easy to pick those numbers out. Like you would need to do some really invasive medical procedures to really figure out <laughs> exactly what those numbers are, right? It's really, really tricky. And I don't think we have that kind of technology as Angular developers, maybe in Angular 18. Um, but uh, without that, you really need to be like, you really just need to be monitoring. You, you know, there's the old axiom, you can't manage what you don't measure. And if you're not measuring things, you're not gonna be able to actually manage the performance and your users, um, happiness with their performance. I love that. We had a question from Danny. I wanted to save it till we had a moment to pause. He was asking for some key considerations and strategies for maintaining performance and reliability in web applications. And I know we've covered quite a lot. I didn't know if you had a, a five step process to, <laughs> yeah, we went five steps, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think we've covered the first one. And that's monitor to be able to identify to if there are issues. Yeah, monitor. There's so many free tools that do this. Like you said, for Firebase Performance is my favorite. It's completely free for any size application. You can do the Google Analytics. There's big players in the space like Datadog and Sentry and Logs.io. You can check out Polaris. That's my little app. I think we're trying to do it somewhere in between the big players and the little players. Mm -hmm. Feel free to come check us out, but start monitoring. 
Hmm. And then the second consideration too is think about whether or not you're building a website or a web app. You know, I think as developers, it's easy to get those two confused or we all, we all think that because we're Angular developers, we're all building the same thing. But if you're building something that's like public facing where you have a lot of traffic and you don't have to log in to get to the bulk of the experience, you're probably building something that feels more like a website to me. And it's going to have a whole different set of performance considerations than the kinds of um, web apps that I think I've spent a lot of my time on where like a user has to log in before they can do anything productive. It's this application maybe in like in a back office. And it's going to have very different performance um, considerations to it. For example, like a website, you probably might care a lot more about like Lighthouse scores, um, time to interactivity, that first, that first render, and thinking a lot about how quickly are you getting results in front of people. Whereas if like you're building a back office application where you have a captive audience, let's be honest here, they don't really care how like fast that first contentful paint was, but they are going to care if they're seeing error messages because your API has some degradation to it. And so think critically about what kind of thing you're building. And then, you know, from there you can think about, okay, what are my users expecting? And that's where you really need to spend time optimizing performance or caring about performance. So you talked about like a timer, right? And putting that in, how, how about collecting these errors, right? Like mm -hmm. what's the approach to adding that to our application to get that data going through? Yeah, so if you've got the code that's doing a timer, you could probably also put like a try catch block around it and know when you hit an exception instead, stop that timer and then forward an error message up somewhere. Um, my favorite way that I've done this on the cheap or on the fly is I've put in place like a little Firebase function and I just sent a message to a Slack channel every time my error, my users hit an error and it would just capture what the error message was, dump it into a Slack channel, I could see it in real time. And like you can get that spun up in probably like 30 minutes and just get some really, really basic error tracking in place. Does error tracking like that cost the user anything? Cost the user anything? Mm -hmm. I don't think it does. Like I think that kind of error tracking, um, you know, you can do it in the background where the user doesn't have to know that you sent another API request or backend request when they hit an error and you're just logging it. Uh, <laughs> if you really care about performance, take a look at the, uh, oh, I always forget about the name of this API, Send Beacon. This is a, um, a relatively unheard of web browser API, but it allows you to send uh, web requests where you don't care about getting a response back um, and you're okay with it like happening kind of outside of the main execution of the application. And it's really great for these kinds of data collection or performance collection um, use cases where you wanna collect this data, send it to a server so you can do something interesting with these performance metrics but not impact anything to do with the runtime performance of the application. So make sure you're using APIs like send beacon to collect those error messages and send them in the right place. That's cool. Yeah. Any other questions? So Polaris um, is, what are the, well, what, what does players provide? Uh, you, we talked about the ability to be able to capture these, but does it do any monitoring of those incidents? Or are you able to set thresholds within there to be able to be notified? Like basically, I, I don't care that the user typed in a bad password and they got back a 401 or something like that. I don't care about those types of errors. I, yeah. But the ones that I actually care about that I'm seeing that a lot of people are having a particular issue. Yeah. So... Um, Polaris is two parts. It's like a four kilobyte SDK that you embed directly in your Angular app, and it lets you do the measurements. So you can start and stop timers and collect error messages. And it does, it follows all the best practices that I've already laid out. It's using SendBeak and it's staying off the main thread. It's not collecting user permissions. It's not collecting PII. It's doing just the smallest amount of monitoring and measuring needed to do incident detection well. And it forwards all of those off to the Polaris server. And from there, you get to create what are called indicators of performance. So you kind of define these indicators, maybe like how long that login flow is taking or how often the login flow is failing. And uh, we're gathering that information about like their region, their connection quality, things like that. So you can really make some fine grained indicators of performance. So if you care about the performance of logging in for your users in the United States with an effective connection quality of 4G on new handsets, you can define that kind of performance indicator. And then from there, you apply thresholds to it. 
And what we'll do is in real time, every time we're getting those measurements in, we're going to check those against those thresholds and we'll send you alerts in whichever tool you want to, Slack, PagerDuty, Twitter, you name it. And we'll let you know, hey, something doesn't seem to be right. Something's not working correctly. Here's some of the measurements that we've collected that are associated with this. Now it's up to you to go use whatever tool you want to do to go debug this, to go figure out what's going wrong. But yeah, we'll help you figure out that maybe something's not working right. I still can't help. You mentioned Twitter. That seems like an odd API <laughs> to choose. Like, hey, one day to let everybody know yeah. that our app ain't working so Everyone well. knows. Well, in my head, I was like, oh, he means DM. He yeah, means, yeah, he means DM. DM like, he doesn't mean yeah. we're tweeting out. To the <laughs> he definitely means privately. I mean, if you want to let your user know, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Is there whatever any... incident detection tool you want to, we will connect to it and let you handle it from there. Is there an API as well to get to that data? So like if I'm building my own internal management application and I want to get some answers. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. We don't want to be like a data silo. We don't want to capture all this data and not let you have access to it. So we put a few charts in front of it, of course, just to let you visualize a little bit of it from within Polaris. But we'd rather you export all that data. So there's a GraphQL API to get it. Um, we're working on Grafana plugins. If you really like Grafana, so you can just pull that into Grafana or whatever visualization tool you want to. Uh, data is yours. You get to have it. It's not for us. We just want to do the real-time detecting of alerts and uh, let you know, hey, I think your app might be broken. <laughs> well, this has been a really fun conversation. And I honestly, I agree with you. I think there are... <laughs> A lot of considerations that we, perhaps it is bandwidth. Maybe we're, <laughs> maybe we're overwhelmed as developers. But I think uh, these things can really uh, help our end user if we can only but stop to ask the questions or gather the data and look at it. Mm -hmm. But I love it absolutely. Any other questions from you guys before we do some picks? So is there like a, a free tier pricing tier like? If I wanted to start using this Checklist. in my application, get a get a feel for it, right? And with yeah. Polaris, um, what what am I kind of getting into to to get that going? So yeah, just visit us at getpolaris.ai. You can uh, request a demo right from there. We do have a really healthy free tier. We'll let you do something like ten thousand measurements for free a month, and help you just get set up with doing some incident detection. And then from there, we're priced, I think, really affordably compared to a lot of other big players in the space. And I think it's really simple too. It's like a simple four ninety nine a month. And we'll do incident detection for any number of applications for you, any number of measurements. So come check us out, getplayers.ai, request a demo. We'd love to talk to you and help you do performance a little bit better in your Angular app. Very cool. And if I have um, Firebase already with some timers and I want to port over, is it, am I expecting kind of, well, it all depends on how I have that architected, right? But like, yeah. uh, is it kind of close, the same kind of concept? It sounded like it's kind of close, so maybe there, there's a road there that's like, okay, I hey, can kind of pivot there. Very much so, yeah. It's it's a very similar API. It's not quite drop in and drop out, but you would feel very comfortable if you're if you're comfortable with it. And yeah, also do look into those tools like Firebase Performance, Google Analytics. A lot of these other tools do this. It's the same type of thing. Mm -hmm. I really think that as any of the developers, we should be thinking more about performance and reliability. So while I'm building one, please look at all of them. There's a lot of great tools in this space. Let's all do a better job measuring and monitoring performance and reliability. I love it. Well, Mike or Justin, do either of you have things you want to highlight for this week? Pick. I don't have any. I didn't come in with any picks planned. I'll wreck my brain as other people. I'm like, maybe Justin's will spark inspiration. <laughs> I doubt it. My pick is Friday. I'm just happy it's the weekend. <laughs> oh, no, actually, I do have a pick. I have a gaming Tell pick. Yes. Yeah, I know. It just came to me. Uh, so there's this game called Kingdom Two Crowns. Uh, I don't know if love anybody's it. ever heard of it. Uh, it's awesome. Uh, I love it. I love it. I'm a big co-op fan. So my wife and I play it. We love that for the co-op sense. But they also made a Kingdom 80s. We love the 80s, too. It's single player. Um, but it comes out on console next week. So it was just on PC up until now. Uh, but it comes out on console next week, supposedly. So looking forward to finally playing some Kingdom 80s. Oh, my gosh. I didn't know this. I played, I think, the solo version. Because there was a solo version, right? Of Kingdom? Because yeah. I yeah. like think Two Crowns came later. And I was like, oh, my. Because it's the side-scroller pixely. 
mm-hmm. super sexy. Like, oh my gosh, I was just like weeping at the graphics. <laughs> I had no. So, how is it 80s? How do you take something? Oh, it's all 80s, I guess. I don't know. I haven't okay. played it yet. I've been waiting for the console because, like, I didn't want to get it on PC because, yeah. you know, sometimes you got to get out of the PC and sit on your couch and yes. play on the console. And so, we've been waiting to get it on the console, but apparently it's just straight 80s. Kind of got that. Oh, my um, God. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Check it out. <laughs> uh, my pick's the British Bake Off. We 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 started it last night, the latest season, and it brings me so much joy. So you need a little bit of just pure goodness in your life. <laughs> Some wholesome baking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, Mike uh, Brocky, do you have anything that was sparked? Nothing. You got nothing, nothing for sparked. Us? Sorry, got nothing. <laughs> no, we love you despite your lack of pick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike Ryan, do you have any highlights you'd like to make for us? Yeah, I've been. My pick is uh, SmokyMountains.com. They have a fall foliage prediction map. It's a little interactive map where you can see where peak fall foliage colors are uh, all across the United States. Oh and my gosh! It's really, really great if you're looking for something to do this weekend and you go find the closest fall foliage colors changing in your neck of the woods. Highly recommend checking it out. Smoky Mountains. What? Dot com. Dot com. I know it says Smoky Mountains. Dot com, but it's not just the Smoky Mountains. It's the full uh, U.S. United That's States on their amazing. fall foliage map. I do yeah. a lot of like personal photography, especially with humans. And yeah. like this is the time this is the time of year to get your picks done and like mm-hmm. to be able to find the spots. Like, oh my gosh, Mike. <laughs> Highly <laughs> recommend. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on and telling us all about me. your experience with site reliability and how we can improve and telling us about the gambit of options we have to <laughs> start monitoring and reporting and things. But we really appreciate you and all that you do for our community, Mike. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having <laughs> me on. It's so nice seeing all of you again and having a great conversation. Thanks for all the good questions. Oh, right. Excellent. All right. We're going to hear a word from our sponsors and sign off, but we'll see you all on the next one. <laughs> Bye. Angular Air is sponsored by Kendo UI for Angular. We have over 100 components built from the ground up in Angular or each framework and library that it's built for. So not only do we have Angular on the JavaScript side, but we have Kendo UI for React, jQuery, and Vue as well. And if you're on the .NET side of life, we have things for Blazor, Maui, WPF, and so much more. All of our libraries are themable, customizable, and of course come with killer professional support. So try it out for free today at kendoui.com.